Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Channel 781 City Council debrief. Uh, this week in the City Council Committee meetings, um, in the Public Work and Public Safety Committee meeting, Councillor Harris got to grill uh, the utility company about the uh, blackout issues on Moody Street. The Licenses and Franchises Committee met um, in the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting, there was a discussion of community block grants, as well as a continuation of the discussion about recording meetings. And in the Committee of the Whole, there was another lengthy discussion about enforcement of single family zoning and in particular um, issues caused uh, by renters and college students. Uh, so we'll discuss all of those things. And I'm here with uh, Chris Gamble. Hello, everyone. And James Crickellis. Hello, everyone. And two more things to mention before we get started. The Traffic Commission made the decision to shut down Moody Street this summer um, for a third year um, to allow it to be open for pedestrians. Uh, not unexpected, but it's now official. And um, you can see that video on the video of that meeting on uh, the Waltham Data YouTube channel if you're interested um, in that. I also wanted to mention that the Rules and Ordinances Committee met, met this week, but we didn't get to see it, it was late. And um, so James and Chris uh, weren't able to stay. And for some reason, WCAC records it, but they don't put it online till a couple days later. And that's unfortunate because we think there was a discussion of Uma Flowers permit, we don't know that. But if there was, we'll watch the video and we'll have that for you next time. Um, so let's start off with the Public Works and Public Safety Committee. Uh, Chris, can you tell us what happened there? Definitely. I also want to touch on the two things you just mentioned. Um, one about the uh, the um, ordinance and rules committee. I just think it's hilarious that even people like us, like if we're not physically at those meetings, we have no idea what's going on. And if we don't have any idea what's going on, how is anyone else supposed to have any idea what's going on? So it's 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 that's a very concerning uh, lack of transparency uh, in the local government. And about the Moody Street shutdowns. Um, I just have an anecdote about that that I love telling people. Um, there's a guy named Mark Rudnick in the city, um, really um, one of the longtime activists in Waltham, um, not as um, out and about as he used to be, but started the land trust, uh, helped start the farm um, and a bunch of other things. Um, and we, during COVID, we ran into each other uh, just chatting in like 2020 and she was talking about the need to shut Moody Street down um, and just close it off to just pedestrian traffic and uh, I said you know that's a great idea you know I love the idea you know I hate cars and I love walking um, and I said but I don't think it's going to happen like that I don't think that political power is there and he's and he told me he's like just wait we're gonna we're gonna make it happen and then a year later Moody Street gets shut down and then I run into him again and I was like, hey, dude, good job. Like you did at least this. And he's like, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be shut down permanently forever. And I'm like, I don't know if that's going to happen. And now it's being shut down again. And I don't know, maybe it will. And now, so Mark, if you're listening to this, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe you were right. Um, anyway, public works and public safety. Uh, so um, the last meeting, uh, Kathy and Harris invited an Eversource uh, representative into this coming meeting and they were there and she basically grilled them on, you know, why are there rolling blackouts? And especially last summer, uh, it was just much worse. The Eversource person being very professional, very corporate, had all the right answers about how last summer was a fluke and how it was just like, uh, what it, I wrote this down, what did they say? I, I don't even understand what it means, but um, there were fault lines and the cables um, responsible for all of those outages, but that's fixed um, and they don't see it going forward. Kathy Ann, um, doing her job very well, asked for a schedule of all the planned improvements and all the workings and all the planned outages for 2022. Um, she, I thought she did a good job just doing exactly what she's paid to do, which is represent her constituents. And this is something that they are not pleased about. Okay, thank you. And next on the list, um, with James, you were at Licenses and Franchises. Can you tell us anything about that? Sure. This is a return to form for Licenses and Franchise, that is to say being relatively uneventful. Uh, there was the renewal of a uh, fortune teller's license and 
I think the rest of the people on the docket were no-shows for their license renewals. But I think basically all of them went ahead anyway. So nothing too exciting. Thank you. And um, economic and community development. And we have two issues there. We have block grants. Who wants to talk about block grants? Um, yeah, I can do that. I don't even think James okay. was at the meeting. Um, at that oh, sorry. Time. <laughs> um, so Waltham, and I'm sure other communities, I'm sure this is a very uh, not particular to Waltham, um, has this thing called community block grants. And they are this thing where organizations and nonprofits, uh, they can apply for money. They do like a whole you know, application and they detail what the money's gonna be used for. And then they, the city approves these things. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second. <clears throat> Sorry, this is not turned around. Um, but this is everyone that was awarded the money that was, this was released recently. And you know, there's very cool uh, people here, very cool things that are happening. And it's about a million dollars. I forget how this money is used. I forget if it's from the federal government or from our taxes, but um, there's a million dollars over very cool things. You've got the day center here, opportunities for inclusion, Latinos in Acción, uh, Africanos here. So this, you know, this is a this is a cool thing that the city does. I'm happy to see it. Um, happy to see where the money went. Um, so that's what they discussed first. Uh, just a few back and forth, but mostly just releasing that. Um, and then for the more nitty gritty, uh, the director of public access was back talking about recording of these meetings. Um, I I think the tide has turned, and I think these meetings are gonna be recorded, which is good because I've been saying that they weren't gonna be recorded, but it seems like they're, they're going back and forth. It seems like they're having meetings and it seems like, like we're reaching a number. I think the number is now $90,000, which just seems ridiculously high for me, but I don't, I don't what do I know about it? Um, what I do know is that it takes, if you pay someone $20 an hour for 24 meetings, it's $2,600 a year. So that, plus the server space, plus the, plus the transportation, somehow that equals $90,000. But um, so, I mean, it seems like they're, it's gonna happen. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, James, do you have any uh, comments there? Uh, the main, the only comment I had was that uh, from the WCAC director, uh, when, she, when she was up there, I think she seemed to make it pretty clear that like they aren't particularly invested in what happens to the footage that they're mandated to take once they put it up on cable and that they explicitly do not care if the city was to say run its own YouTube, you know, like say have the clerk's office or something run the YouTube channel, upload every video that WSDSC has after they put it up on the air or whatever, in, in whatever order. Mm. So like and that would then, and she specifically mentioned that that would get them subtitled and it would be automatic subtitles, which is basically the same thing that they would be paying money for. <laughs> so like you could just take the money that you would have been paying on that and pay someone to correct the YouTube subtitles and probably end up with a better result. <laughs> but again, I'm just advocating for some outside the box thinking here. I'm not actually expecting that to happen. Yeah, so I wasn't, I didn't see this meeting. I haven't seen the video of the meeting yet. So uh, just, uh, I'm not sure I understood. So she was she was advocating for someone in the city to someone in the city to repost them to YouTube. That came, yeah, that came up in that thing, and they she specifically said that uh, they're only invested in getting like their their contract is fulfilled once it's on cable, and that they're not like it's not like they care about the IP or the keeping the video even. And it sounds like they're in well. Their, their contract may be fulfilled, but federal law requires them to provide captions both on cable and on the online videos if they have online videos, which they do. So I guess I, I, I'm going to watch the, 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 video, the video of the meeting because I, I don't want to, but I guess I'm a little concerned that I'm really happy this is going forward, but I'm a little concerned it's going forward in partnership, very expensive partnership with people who don't seem to care at all about um, captioning or the yeah, application I thought, under the law yeah i thought it was uh, definitely strange someone brought up captions i wish i could remember to give them credit um but someone was like what about captioning and, and the lady was like put it on youtube and it's just weird uh because we you know we put our videos on youtube and we hand caption out everything you know it's mm -hmm. not perfect and so uh counselor paz uh mentioned like hey can we like 
you know, to maybe be a little more professional about like how we do these captions. And they said that they could run captions through their subscription-based captioning service, but they couldn't guarantee that it would be any better than uh, YouTube, which is weird. Um, uh, the software uh, base, so auto captions. Um, but uh, I just thought it was a little strange, definitely. Um, you know, $90,000 and you can't caption the videos. Well, it also, if she thinks that auto captions are sufficient, which which they might be, the YouTube ones are getting better all the time. There's still, we still check ours because they get things, the things they get wrong are sometimes important things like names. So, um, but if she thinks those are sufficient, why hasn't she been doing this all along? Like, why hasn't she already cross posting them to YouTube? So it's still kind of, it's kind of a pretty negative attitude about, about the captioning issue. I yeah, I don't think I like this lady. I've never met her before. And these are just the two meetings I've seen. I don't, know, I don't think I like her. Well, she, you know, it's a tough job, especially now to run public access. And she made that case very well at a prior meeting, but then she also sort of used it as an excuse for things that it wasn't logically an excuse for. So yeah, I'm a little concerned about her attitude about accessibility. Did you have any additional comments, James? That, that was the bulk of it. And again, like it's, it mentioned the attitude as like an issue and it, it, it's just always surprising to me that like this is something that doesn't seem like a big ask and it's amazing that it's taken this long and that it's like requires this much back and forth as opposed to just like if they had taken the initiative to hire an intern to put these on YouTube in the first place this would be a lot less of an issue yeah yeah and it's also it's it's also going to be disappointing if we finally get the recordings but we can't be totally like celebrated because they're not doing captions or whatever because that was important so all right so moving on to so in the committee of the whole um, they did a few things. They reappointed some people, which involved talking to them about, you know, acknowledging the work they've done, which is a nice thing they do. Um, but most of the meeting was taken up by a conversation that was like a little under two hours long. That was a continuation of the conversation about um, defining and enforcing uh, single family zoning. And for those who don't remember, um, Councillor Durkee, um, introduced a resolution um, that some other councillors signed on to. And two weeks ago, they brought in the city solicitor um, to talk about this issue. And uh, it became clear that what a lot of the councillors were concerned about is enforcement of, single of what's allowed in a single family home. And enforcement is the building inspector. So this time around, they brought in the building inspector. And the first three, um, counselors who questioned him, um, they all seemed like they, uh, as you may remember from last week, this came out of community meetings where there's um, homeowners who are, are bringing up this issue and expecting the counselors to follow up on it. Um, so uh, the first several counselors who spoke were all kind of taking like, you know, a strong tone of why aren't we enforcing this? Um, Councillor Durkee was the first to ask questions and his impression, and it, it later turned out that Councillor Cates got a, the same impression. Um, his impression from what the city solicitor had said was that the city doesn't have to allow um, renting out single family homes. It doesn't have to allow anything that violates the sanctity of single family zoning. Um, and so Councillor Durkee's point was, if there's a house that's having issues, we shouldn't have to wait until we've documented and tons and tons of issues to do something about it. We should just be able to say, well, you're not allowed here in the first place because you're renting in a single family um, uh, zoning and that should be it. And he didn't understand why we weren't doing that. Um, and and LaFosse sort of pushed him on the same thing. And what he explained was that may be true in the world of law, but in the world of enforcement, that's not true. That in order to enforce anything, he needs either an ordinance or it has to be in the state building code. Um, and there is no law that says that you can't rent out a single family home, um, which is not surprising because a lot of people do it in Waltham. As the conversation went on, the counselors got more specific in sort of asking him, uh, what do you recommend we do uh, to change our ordinances 
um, to make it easier to enforce. And he actually had a very specific rec recommendation. Um, he started off by explaining that he used to work in Newton and um, in Newton, they would um, threaten uh, land lords uh, with taking them to criminal court. But we don't do that in Waltham. It's the policy of the administration, meaning the mayor, um, not to take landlords into criminal court. We, we have as a civil fine system, which means he can give people fines and the fines build up. And then if they don't pay them, eventually they get taken to civil court. And he, But he said that we usually end up settling for much less than the total of the fines. And that's the law department's call. Um, on how to settle. And he said that in Newton, um, they would, he dealt with about 500 cases and only a very small number of those went to criminal court. And the ones that did only had, a sh most of them only had a show cause hearing some of the, only a very small number had actual charges. So he felt that the threat of bringing someone to criminal court was much more effective um, than civil penalties. And so he had drafted a uh, ordinance, which is now with the legal department being reviewed, so it's not public, but he explained that um, it would be an ordinance that would create a new category of housing, which is college housing, and in that category, a non-resident landlord can rent to up to four unrelated people. He didn't uh, define unrelated, although there was some conversation of that later. Um, and uh, in their lease, they would have to put in the tenants' leases that they're required to maintain the peace of the neighborhood. And um, so that way, if the landlord wasn't living up to that, he could, uh, they would have the threat of going to criminal court for breaking the ordinance. Some of the counselors seemed supportive of that, but uh, Counselor Durkee um, was more critical of it because he said, you know, it was my understanding that this is more about the behavior of people. And if the behavior is consistent with single family zoning, so if three people are being jackasses or if two people are being jackasses or people um, who aren't college students are having an issue, your, your ordinance doesn't cover that. Um, and the uh, building inspector basically responded by saying, you know, we can go after college students, we can't go after people who are unrelated people living in a house who are not college students because how do we prove that they're unrelated basically. Um, and he talked about the difficulty of defining that. Um, so I think that sums up most of the discussion. There were a few other counselors who spoke, um, but mostly with clarifying type questions. Um, but then they moved on to bringing in, uh, they had representatives from both Brandeis and Bentley. They had student um, life and housing people, as well as the police chiefs from both. So there was a conversation of all the things they currently do to try to address um, issues uh, with um, college student houses that cause problems for the city. And uh, most of that wasn't that interesting. Uh, they did give some interesting numbers about how much housing costs at uh, Bentley and Brandeis. And it seems like the reason so many people are in off-campus housing isn't because they don't have enough housing on campus, it's because their housing is very expensive. Um, but during that discussion, Councillor Paz made comments about working with the um, colleges better to solve these, and he made a comment about restorative justice for uh, you know students who are having issues. Councillor Durkee, seemingly in response to that, um, said, you know, uh, he gave an example of there was a college house where they were having loud parties and the school um, set up a meeting and talked to them about it and gave them a warning. And a week later, they had a huge beer pong party. And he said, I understand that, you know, being arrested could really mess up a college student's career. But I think in a situation like that, they should be arrested because it was a, an affront to the neighbors and it was an affront to me. And um, so that's, I thought was remarkable for a counselor to be calling for an arrest for something that's, it's not even clear if that's a crime. It's not actually illegal to have a beer pong party unless you're underage. But um, I'm gonna pass it off <laughs> as I've spoken for a while. James, do you have any other observations to add about this meeting? Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me was I think that it was the Bentley uh, police chief saying that they are, they are it is already their current practice to be surveilling suspect houses and that they have a list of problem 
houses passed to them either from the Waltham PD or like just a general list that they've been keeping for, as an ongoing thing, which is interesting. And it sounds like the goal of all of this is to sort of tie together the, like it makes some sort of like code enforcement task force type of thing to sort of more officially tie the police into uh, code enforcement and formalize some relationships between organizations within the city that may not necessarily be as formalized as they are for like pursuing these things. This does this does remind me of what happened with like a certain previous city councilor. Uh, Sort of that informal relationship being asking a the Waltham police chief to intimidate one of his tenants to leave. So that's it, it may sound like it's not a it, it may sound anodyne and just enforcing laws as they are, but it is definitely an escalation for tenants potentially. Yeah, he uh, he brought that up. I forget what that guy's name now um, that spoke most of the time. <clears throat> but he was saying, you know, we keep talking about college students and, you know, this being the problem. But he has to follow it by the code. And, you know, this he said this is a problem everywhere. It's not just college students. It's, you know, it's just the cost of living is so high. Wages are so low. People are congregating together um, and people are just living together that when they're not families. And so if you're going to uh, make it illegal for college kids to live together in single family homes and you're going to make it illegal for you know, working class people to uh, live in single family homes. And so it's just a very slippery slope and the language being used was very, very concerning to me. Um, and I guess an anecdote for me is, um, you know, what interests me most in Waltham is, you know, what is effective, what, what, what power dynamics, how do they work? And what is effective organizing Waltham? And just like it was discussed a million times, this has always been a problem. Um, you know, people have been living together, people have been throwing parties that Sean Durkee wasn't invited to forever. Um, and, you know, this is only a problem, this is only being brought up now because the tenants, uh, not the tenants, the homeowners around these people got organized. They're coming to every meeting, they're demanding community, uh, meetings, uh, they're emailing people, and that is effective. And so, you know, that really interests me and people should remember what is effective when it comes to your campaigns in Waltham. Um, overwhelming public pressure. Um, but those are my anecdotes. This is a very weird conversation, very concerning. Uh, I didn't like it at all. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, well, first I wanted to note, it wasn't all the counselors who were in on this, although a lot of them signed on to the resolution, it was seemed to be um, uh, counselors Durkee, um, Lafasi, and Cates who were the most set on, you know, doing something more punitive uh, to fix this situation. And Councillor McMenamin actually didn't speak at all, which is unusual for her not to speak in this type of an issue. So I wanted to note that. Um, and there were others who spoke, who like uh, Councillor Harris, who were more, and also Councillor Bradley McCarthy, who were more neutral, just trying to clarify things. It was really just those three who were taking this, uh, you know, hard approach to college students. So the other thing that seemed odd to me, and this has to do with what Chris was saying is this was coming from the concerns of homeowners and say all the counselors were speaking from the place of being homeowners but what's funny about that is some of them I believe are also landlords I don't know who's a landlord exactly um, but they certainly all have friends who are landlords and 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 some of the the you know the old families that get a lot of respect in Waltham who've had a house in the family in Waltham for generations Part of the way you do that is when there's no family member who needs the house, you rent it out. So you keep it in the family. And there was nobody, it seemed like, and, and he didn't exactly say this, but it seemed like, you know, uh, Councillor Durkee wanted to basically say that any renting out of single family homes is illegal. And it was just surprising to me that there was no landlord perspective at all represented in this meeting, even though you would you would think the landlords would have a lot of, of say. But it comes down to, I think, what Chris said, that, that it was the homeowners who organized in this case. So that's whose perspective the council is looking at it from. Won't someone think of the landlords? <laughs> Normally, I would be all for filing criminal charges against landlords and stuff. I think the concerning thing is more that they're that they were, they were bringing that up, but then they were only talking about pursuing them against like students and tenants that annoy them. Oh yeah, it's definitely about criminalizing renting in Waltham, which is just a dangerous trend, slippery slope. 
we don't invite Sean Durkee to one party. Eventually it turns into, I'm not allowed to rent a Walton anymore. Um, well, people certainly were very passionate about, about some specific examples. And there was actually the building inspector actually named an address, <laughs> which is unusual. That's our best to summarize that meeting. If you have two hours, you can watch it and judge for yourself. And I think that's all um, the, that we had to cover tonight. Am I forgetting anything? That's everything. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll be back next week with the full city council meeting, and hopefully we'll let you know what happened in rules and ordinances, too. Thank you, everybody. Night, everybody.